reading. I posted the cover of the version I like, but this guy. And I am basically recording this as an audiobook for friends. Uh, we are halfway through chapter five or six. Yeah, chapter five, six against the city. So, uh, let me go get my phone just so I can have Twitch Manager open. Put it somewhere. Hi. Uh, where did I stick my phone? Oh, there it is. Along with the charger. The idea being here, <clears throat> I usually record in the mornings, but I got inspired based on some guy I was just watching doing Jackbox gaming. I'm like, this can be so casual. It doesn't have to be this codified stream setup. Oh, so much technology. So I figured. Why not just record or stream myself reading stuff out loud? That could be fun. It could be really fun, actually. So, check my SD card. I have my my big camera SD card. That's also about five gigabytes worth of data stored on this big SD card. Uh, let me go ahead and pop it out. I don't need it because my audio recorder will not take it. I, I'm thinking I want to check, check and make sure the 2 gig SD card actually doesn't have anything on it. Additionally, let me pull up Twitch Manager so that I know that you're there listening in case you wanted to say something or ask anything. Yeah, one viewer. That's cool. Let's see. Viewer. Ringtone. Turn myself down here. Um two viewers. Well, whoever you are, welcome. I'm just going to be reading a book out loud, so feel free to jump in and ask a question or say something or whatever, but, and I'll try to pay attention to this stream, <laughs> the chat in the stream to make sure I know you're there. Uh, okay, so let's just make sure we are on and ready. I need the 2 gig card. It looks empty to me. It is empty. There's nothing in DCIM. There's nothing in music and utility is always empty. Why this recorder makes a utility folder when it never actually reuses it, I don't know. But, in any case, I'm going to also grab a drink of water because my throat is feeling a bit parched, even though I just finished some coffee. So I'll be right back. Hey, you. <laughs> you gonna come visit? decided not to come hang out with me in here. And it is a bit cluttered and off on the floor, so. Um, yeah. So let's see what we're doing. 
Put it up here. I did not touch my levels at all. So I have actually already read books one and two. Oh, there we go. Now I can hear myself. Feedback from the recorder. I shouldn't say feedback, that's a nasty thing in audio world, but I am in electronics world professionally, and so feedback is kind of necessary. So, okay. I feel like that is decent right there. Um, yeah, we were halfway through chapter five the last time I left this off, which was, I believe, Thursday? Thursday morning or something like that. And I made it through editing chapter one of this book, Pool of Fire. So there are something like eight or nine chapters in this entire thing. Uh, nine chapters. So we're on chapter five. We're almost halfway through with this thing. Actually, we're over halfway through if you consider chapters to be marker, more, marker points as far as time goes. These are really long chapters, though. So I've been able to record 30 minutes at a time. Uh, this recorder only handles about 30 minutes at a time before it auto-tracks itself, and it's really, really annoying in that respect. But I cannot really complain too much. So we'll see what we can do here. Uh, I'm going to actually turn, twist, tilt, twist, just so I have some visibility too. Yeah, that seems, that, that sounds good to me. The levels are decent. And I'm going to post-produce this thing to make sure I take out any glitches in the voice portion of it. So... Let us record, and I'll just start reading this thing from the middle of chapter five. Q, record. All right. Middle of chapter five, The Pool of Fire by John Christopher. Fritz and I had found during our earlier stay here that there were many places in the city which were rarely, if ever, used. A lot of these were storehouses, stacked with crates, like the cavern through which we had entered, or empty in preparation for some future use. I imagine that in the building in the city, they had allowed for space of expansion. I imagine that in building the city they had allowed for expansion, and that a lot of it had not yet been taken up. At any rate, this was something of which we could take advantage. The masters, as exemplified in unvarying routes, so often followed by the tripods. No. The masters, as exemplified in the... Okay, I'm going to actually start completely over with this. Because this is like two sentences in and I've already made two mistakes. Okay. Um, starting over. Actually, I'm going to track it. Just because I can ignore a longer track. Chapter 5, Halfway Through, The Pool of Fire, John Christopher. And I'm going to get a lot of breathing noises, which is not good. Fritz and I had found, during our earlier stay here, that there were many places in the city which were rarely, if ever, used. A lot of these were storehouses, stacked with crates, like the cavern through which we had entered, or empty in preparation for some future use. I imagined that in building the city they had allowed space for expansion, and that a lot of it had not yet been taken up. At any rate, this was something of which we could take advantage. The masters, as exemplified in the unvarying routes so often followed by the tripods, were creatures of repetitious habit in many ways, and the human slaves would never venture anywhere except on a direct errand. It would have been unthinkable thinkable for them to pry into what they regarded as the holy mysteries of the gods. We headed for a pyramid which Fritz had marked down less than a hundred yards from the ramp leading down to the water purification plant. It was obvious that the ground floor was not in use brownish fuzz, slowly growing and easily brushed off by content. Con 
brownish fuzz slowly go brownish fuzz slowly growing and easily brushed off by contact covered the the exposed surfaces of the crates. There were a number of fun fungus life okay. We headed for a pyramid which Fritz had marked down less than a hundred yards from the ramp leading down to the water purification plant. It was obvious that from the ground floor that it was not in use. Brownish fuzz, slowly growing and easily brushed off by contact, covered the exposed surfaces of the crates. There were a number of such fungus-like growths in the city, which the masters did not seem to bother about. To make ourselves doubly safe, though, we went on into the basement, where the crates were stacked even higher. We cleared a space at the far corner and began to set up our apparatus. We were depending on the resources of the city itself for a good part of our equipment glass tubes, for instance, and jars, which we knew to be available. What we had brought with us were chiefly small tools and rubber tubes and sealers. Another item for which we were going to poach on our en enemy was the method of heating. There were no fires here, but there were pads of various sizes which, when a button was pressed, gave off a concentrated heat radiant heat. The smaller ones were used by the slaves to boil liquids for their masters. They had attachments which fitted into the sockets in the walls of the buildings, and when heat stopped being produced, they were left fitted they were fitted in and left for an hour or so, after which they were as good as new. Beanpole had explained that it must have been a form of electricity which our scientists had rediscovered. Day broke. The light paled through the shades of green, and there was even a pale, barely dark ba Day broke. The light paled through the shades of green, and there was even a pale barely a visible disk, which was the sun. In two shifts, Fritz guided one and I the other. In two... Oh, good grief. Day broke. The light paled through the shades of green, and there was even a pale, barely visible disk, which was the sun. In two shifts, Fritz guiding one and I the other, we went to one of the mutual... to the communal places to freshen. Okay. In two shifts... Good grief. Day broke. The light paled through shades of green, and there was even a pale, barely visible disk, which was the sun. In two shifts, Fritz guiding one and I the other, we went to one of the communal places to freshen ourselves, to eat and drink, and replace the filters which we used in our masks. This, too, had been carefully chosen. It was the communal place attached to one of the major pyramids, where a large number of masters from different parts of the city met daily to conduct business. Like so many other things, the nature of business itself was baffling. This meant that there was a large and constant turnover of slaves, who had accompanied their masters and whose services had been dispensed with for the time being. Some were there for hours, sleeping on the couches, and the majority of them did not know each other except as anonymous figures, with whom they jostled for places at the dispensing machines or for vacant couches. All of the slaves were always so exhausted that they had little energy for observation anyway. This was to be our principal base, not only for the supply of food and water, but also for the equally pressing needs of recuperation and sleep. We had decided we must work by night and snatch what rest we could during the day. It would not be much, a few hours at a time. During the first day, we foraged for the things we needed. It was astonishingly how smoothly in going. Andre had been right in saying that the three attacks had to be made simultaneously because the whole hope of success depended on the absolute confidence that the masters had in their control of capped humans. We could go where we liked and take what we liked, but because it was unthinkable that we should be doing anything that was not sanctioned by them. We labored through the streets with our booty right under the noses of the enemy. Two of us dragged a vat on a small wheeled trailer through an open space in which on either side a dozen or more masters disport disported with solemn gracelessness in steaming water. The vats were our primary requisition. We got three of them down into the basement and filled them with a mash made of water and a biscuit-like food which was available to slaves in the communal places. The resultant evil-looking concoction was a starchy mess to which we had added a little of the dried yeast which we brought with us. It was not long before it was fermenting. The scientists had said this would happen, even in the different air of the city, but it was a relief to see the bubbles forming all the same. The first stage was underway. As soon as we had got it started, we began constructing the distillation unit. This was not so easy. The normal distillation process involves heating a liquid so that it forms steam. Alcohol, which we were hoping to produce, boils at a lower temperature than water, and so 
The first steam given off has a lot of alcohol in it. The second step should be to cool the, the steam so that it condenses back into a liquid. This, the next step should be to cool the steam so that it condenses back into a liquid. Repeating the process produces progressively more and more concentrated alcohol. Unfortunately, we face the problem of the city's all-pervading heat. We hoped to overcome it by running longer lengths of tubing, giving the steam more time to cool. But it was soon apparent that this was not going to work. The amount, the, amount the amount trickling through was pitiful, a slow drip, which looked as though it would take months to fill the collecting jar. We had to find another way of tackling it. That night, Fritz and I went out together. We traveled cautiously down the ramp to the cavern which held the purification plant. The green lights were on and the machines throbbed with power, but there was no one there. The machines worked automatically, and what need was there to set a guard in place when the only living things were the masters and their devoted slaves? Not a door in the city had a lock on it. On this side of the machines, a pool of seething hot water more than 20 feet across issued into vents which took it to its multifarous courses to be pumped up through the top floors of the pyramids or to form the supply for many of the garden pools and similar amenities and similar amenities at ground level. But beyond, there was another pool here feeding into the machines. In turn, it was fed from a wide arch, breaking the seamless dull gold of the wall. We had climbed a small barrier and found ourselves on a narrow ledge which ran back into a tunnel. We went along it and in, into increasing darkness. Coolness struck up from the tumbling surface of the water. It offered exactly what we required, but we needed more space if we were to set up a distillation apparatus here. Fritz was ahead of me. I only knew he had stopped when his footsteps ceased. It was too dark to see and I called softly, Where are you? Here, take my hand. We were right under the wall by now. The water had a different noise, more riotous, and I guess this must be the point where it bubbled free of its underground confinement. It had to come in from the outer world at a depth low enough to make sure no air came with it. Groping after Fritz, I found myself moving out over the area which earlier had been occupied by the river. There was a kind of platform stretching out, out across the tunnel and leading to a small, smaller tunnel which continued outward, directly above the now subterranean steam stream. Directly above the now subterranean stream. We found what appeared to be the manhole cover for the inspection chamber, and presumably there were others. I imagine they, are, they were there against the possibility of a blockage, but would they would have to use the cap for checking, if so, none of the masters could have gotten into so confined a space. Fritz said, there's a room, Will. I objected. It's pitch black. We have to manage, and eyes become accustomed. I can see a little better already, I think. I could barely see a thing, but he was right. We should have to manage. We needed a coolant, and it, here it was, swirling below us in abundance. I asked, can we start tonight? We can get some of the stuff along, at least. In the nights that followed, we worked frantically to build up supplies. There was a plentiful supply of containers, made of stuff like glass but yielding a little to touch, and we filled those with the product of our labors. There would not have been room for them on the platform, but we were able to stack them along the side of the tunnel. I prayed that there would be no blockage in the water inflow calling for inspection during this time. It did not seem likely that there would. The system was obviously designed for an emergency and probably had not been used since the city was built. It was an exhausting life. In the tunnel, one had some escape from the heat, but the extra gravity still pulled one down and there was still need to wear face masks. We were badly short of sleep also. There were all, only about 12 hours a day during which it was practical, practicable to use the communal rooms, and we had to take the rest of our shifts there. It could be frustrating when the place was full of slaves. On one occasion, dog-tired, I got there to find every couch occupied. I dropped and slept on the hard floor until I was awakened by a hand on my shoulder and realized, with aching eyes and protesting limbs, that I must get up again, put on my mask, and go out into the green mist that was our nearest approach to daylight. But time passed, and slowly our supplies built up. We were working to a schedule and met our target with nearly a week to spare. We went on making alcohol. It was better than ma simply marking time and waiting. 
and the higher the concentration we managed to get into the master's water supply, the more effective, presumably, it was likely to be. We had already identified the conduit leading from the inner pool, which must, which supplied the drinking water system. We were ready for a day and an hour that had been arranged. At last, it came. The precise timing offered one major snag. We had no idea how soon the effects of alcohol would start showing in the masters, nor at what stage they would begin to realize that something was wrong. The three cities we knew were in communication with each other, and it would not do for one to alert the others to a danger that could be averted, so the drinking water in each had to be tampered with at roughly the same time. And there, of course, we faced the problem set by the fact that our world was a globe revolving around the sun. The water purification plants had a daytime staff of masters who looked after the machines on three separate shifts, but were unattended at night. It had been realized that two out of the three attempts could be made in this interval. One just after the day's work ended, the other not long before it began. That meant that the third city had to be not far away from midday when the sabotage attempt was made. It had been agreed upon without question that ours was the expedition which was, must handle this. We had been, we had the advantage of being closer to headquarters and having an, in our number two of who knew the city from experience. It was up to us to somehow complete our task while masters were actually on duty at the plant. We gave it a lot of thought. Although we had gotten away with carting pieces of equipment around and the four newcomers had grown so used to the presence of the masters as to be almost contemptuous of them, this did not happen with Fritz or me, whose memories were still sharp and bitter. It was extremely unlikely that they would fail to query it if they saw us carrying containers out of the tunnel and emptying them into one of the conduits. This was, after all, their own special department, and any humans working there would be under their orders. One of us suggested posing as a slave with a message, calling them all away to some other part of the city. Since they never mistrusted the slaves, they would not doubt the genuineness of it. Fritz dismissed the idea. It would be a strange message, and they might think the slave confused. They would likely to check with the. They would be likely to check with the other masters, perhaps in place to which they were told to go. Remember that they can talk to each other at long distances. In any case, I'm sure that they would not all go. One at least would stay at the machines. Then what? Well, there's only really one possibility. He looked. We looked at him, and I nodded. We must use force. The maximum number of masters on duty at any particular time was four, but one only appeared occasionally. I think he was a supervisor of some kind. Usually there was about three of them, but one of those would frequently be absent, taking a dip in a nearby garden pool. Even armed with the knowledge that a vulnerable spot between nose and mouth, the six of us could not hope to deal with more than two at the same time. Under equal conditions, they would have been so much bigger and stronger than we were, here, with their artificial gravity, the contest would have been hopeless. We had no weapons and no means of making any. The moment we had chosen was half, halfway through the mid-shift of the day. It was necessary to be ready to act as soon as the third master came up the ramp and headed for the garden pool, which meant that we had to have cover within easy reach and observation of the entrance to the plant. Fritz solved the problem by getting us to cut branches from trees in the pool during the night and pile them in a heap. This was frequently done by way of pruning, and the branches left until a squad of slaves came to remove them. We could bank on their going unnoticed for a day at least, so having been in turn to the communal place, we surreptitiously snuggled into the pile, which had some of the texture of seaweed, a clinging, loathsome rubberiness which made the skin crawl. Fritz was in a position where he could look out, the rest of us deeply buried and running, I thought, some risk of smothering if matters were delayed too long. The delay appeared to be very long indeed. I lay in this unpleasant nest, with nothing to see but the fronds in front of my face, dying to know what was happening outside, but not even daring to whisper a question. The stuff was getting sticky too, probably because it was decaying, which did not make the weight any more attractive. I found I had a cramp in one leg, but could not move to ease it. The pain got worse. I would have to massage it. Now, Fritz said, there was no one about. We raced for the ramp, or at least lumbered a little faster than usual. At the bottom we slowed. One master was in view, the other one out of sight behind them, one of, one of the machines. As we approached, he said, What is it? You have some errand here? A message, master. It is three of us. Simultaneously grabbed for tentacles. Fritz leaped, and the other two heaved logs, heaved his legs. Okay. 
Fritz leaped and the other two heaved his legs higher still. It was almost over at once. Fritz struck hard at the weak spot, and with a single ear-splitting howl the master collapsed, sending us sprawling with the last convulsive action. We had thought the second one might be a, more of a problem, but in fact he proved easier. He came around from behind the machine, saw us standing in by his fallen colleague, and asked, What happened here? We made the ritual bow of reverence. Fritz said, The master is hurt, master. We do not know how. Once more, their absolute confidence in the devotion of their slaves gave us the chance we needed. Without hesitation or suspicion, he came forward and bent down slightly, probing at the other with his tentacles. That brought the openings, which were his nose and mouth, within reach of Fritz's fist, without him having to jump. This one dropped without even a cry. This one dropped without even crying out. Drag them out of sight behind the machine, Fritz ordered. Now get on the work. Then get on with the work. Drag them out of sight behind the machine, Fritz ordered. Then get on with the work. No urging was necessary. We had about half an hour before the third master came back. Two worked in the tunnel, bringing the containers out along the narrow ledge, and the rest of us carried them, two at a time, from there to the drinking water conduit and tipped them in. There were about a hundred containers altogether. A dozen trips should do it. The colorless liquid splashed into the water, mixing in without a trace. I ticked off my staggering runs. Nine, ten, eleven. The tentacle caught me without even my even seeing it. The master must have come to the top of the ramp and for some reason paused to look down, instead of proceeding with the usual slap of feet which we would have heard. It was the supervisor, making one of his periodic visits. He obviously saw the procession of slaves with containers, saw the contents being tipped into the conduit, and was curious. He came down spinning, which was their equivalent of running, and was almost silent because of the point he came down, spinning, which was the, their equivalent of running, and was almost silent because only one point of one foot made intermittent contact with the ground. His tentacle tightened around my waist. Boy, he demanded, what is this? Where are the masters? Mario, who had been directly behind me, dropped his container and jumped at him. He was gripped by a cynical, second tentacle in midair. The one that held me a bit... The one that held me bit in, squeezing breath from my body. I saw the other two come up but I could do nothing. I heard myself scream as the squeezing became unbearable. With his third tentacle, the master flailed at the Dutch boy, Jan, tossing him as though he were a doll against the nearest machine. Then he picked up Carlos with it. The three of us were as helpless as trust chickens. He did not know of the other two in the tunnel, but that was a small consolation. They would be bound to check the water. We had come so close to success, and now Jan was struggling to his feet. I was upside down, my masked head brushing against the lower part of the master's body. I saw Jan get a hand on something, a bolt of metal about six inches long and a couple of inches thick, which was used for adjusting one of the machines. And I remembered, before he switched to this expedition, that he had been preparing for a possible entrance into the game, as, dis as a discus thrower. But if the master saw him, I reached down and wrenched at a st nearby stubby leg, trying to dig my nails in. It had as little effect as a gnat biting a cart horse. He must have been aware of it, though, because the tentacle tightened again. I yelled in pain. The agony increased. I was on the point of blacking out. I saw Jan twist his body, tense it for the throw. Then came oblivion. I recovered to find myself propped up against one of the machines. Rather than waste time trying to revive me, they had very properly got on with the job. I was bruised, and when I drew breath it was like inhaling fire. The master lay not far from me on the floor, oozing a greenish ichor from a gash just below the mouth. I watched, dazed, as the last of the containers were tipped in. I watched, dazed, as the last of the containers was tipped in. Front Fritz came up and said, get all the empty containers back into the tunnel in case another one of them comes. He saw what I, that I was conscious. How are you feeling, Will? Not so bad. Have we really done it? He looked at me, and a rare grin spread over his long face. I think we have. I really think we have. We kept quiet. Hmm. What am I looking at? 20 minutes. Wow. I'm going to track this. We crept quietly up the ramp and away. Out in the open, a master saw us but paid no attention. Both Jan and I were walking with difficulty. 
he with a badly bruised leg and I with a stab stabbing burning pain that came with every breath and every movement. This was not remarkable, though. Many slaves were crippled in various ways. The third master had been dragged behind the machine to lie with the other two. It was almost time for the fourth to re return from the garden pool. He would find them and perhaps raise an alarm, but the machines would be running as usual and producing pure water. The contaminated water was already on its way through the pipes to all the taps all over the city. We put a good distance between ourselves and the purification plant. We went to a communal place to freshen up. I drank water, but it tasted no different. From tests on Rookie, the scientists had worked it out that quite a minute portion of alcohol had a paralyzing effect on him, but I'd wondered now if what we had managed to put through was enough. With our masks off, Fritz ran his hands over the upper part of my body. I winced and almost cried out. A fractured rib, he said. I thought so. We will try to make it more comfortable. There were spare masks in the communal place. He ripped one up and used the material to make two bandages, which he fixed above and below the place where it hurt the most. He told me to breathe out as far as possible. Then he tightened and knotted the bandages. It hurt more while he was doing it, but I felt better after that. We waited half an hour before going out. The masters were tremendous consumers of water, never going longer than an hour without drinking. We walked about and watched, but nothing seemed to have changed. They passed us with their usual arrogance, their contemptuousness, their cont they, <clears throat> they passed us with their usual arrogance, their contemptuous disregard. I began to feel despondent again. Then passing a pyramid, we saw one of them come out. Mario gripped my arm unthinkingly and I winced, but the pain did not matter. He teetered over on his stubby three legs and his tentacles moved uncertainly. A moment later, he crashed and lay still. Hmm. All right, that's the end of chapter five. I'm almost here. I do not know. Um, anybody here? I don't know. Yeah, there's someone here. Commander Root and Thicker. Welcome. Oh, do you want Yeah, we could probably add a little text thing. Text GDI. Yas. Is there a stroke on this thing? That'd be nice. Background color. Outline. Outline. Select black. Okay. Background opacity. Outline size. Let's make it kind of... Three's good. Three looks good to me. It's almost seven o'clock at night. Okay. Transition the pool of fire by John Christopher. Okay, so we are ready to get the chapter six going here. Oh man, I probably want to also center this just a tad better. Eh. Brink. That's actually worse than what I was seeing before. Oh well, it's all right. So we've got three chapters left to go. Which I am guessing means that this alcohol in the drinking water ploy that they had is not going to actually work or may not work as good as they thought because I remember how this story ends and it was uh, much more dramatic than just we poisoned all the masters and took over the end. <clears throat> Let me read 
through this just by myself for a minute, just because I'm... <laughs> man. post-production because I have a friend who's actually listening to this in her spare time and I would love to be able to say here listen to the rest of book three instead of my craptastic phone recordings of the first chapter and the preface because I made those in like whatever that podcasting software is on for the Android and it was horrible the noise floor was insanely high and I just decided, you know, I'm going to read these from scratch and it will sound way better. So, twist this while I'm at it just because it sounds like I'm not lined up perfectly. Alright, um, let's go ahead and cue recording. Going... Chapter 6, The Pool of Fire. I do not know what they thought was happening to them, but they plainly failed to work it out. Perhaps they thought it was the sickness, the curse of the Skludzi, operating in a new and more virulent fashion. I suppose the notion of poisoning was something they were incapable of grasping. They had, as we had found with Ruki, an un apparently infallible means of sensing anything in their food and drink which could be injurious. Apparently infallible, but not quite. It is hard to be defensive toward a danger which you have never imagined existed. So they drank, and staggered, and fell, a few at first, and then more and more, until the streets were littered with their grotesque and monstrous bodies. The slaves moved among them, pitifully at a loss, occasionally trying to rouse them, timid and imploring at the same time. In the plaza, where there were more than a score of masters lying there, a slave rose from beside one of the fallen, his face streaming in tears. He called out, The masters are no more, therefore our lives no longer have a purpose. Brothers, let us go to the place of happy release together. Others moved toward him gladly. Fritz said, I did. I thought they might do it. We must stop them. Mario said, How? Does it really matter anyway? Not answering, Fritz jumped onto the small platform of stone, which was sometimes used by one of the masters for a kind of meditation they did. He cried, No, brothers, they are not dead, they sleep. Soon they will wake, and need our care. They were irresolute. The one who had urged them before said, How do you know this? Because my master told me before it happened. It was a clincher. Slaves might lie to each other, but never about anything relating to the masters. The idea was unthinkable. Bewildered, but a little less sorrowful, they dispersed. As soon as it was apparent that the scheme had succeeded, we turned to the second and equally important part of our task. The paralysis, as we knew, was temporary. The paralysis, as we knew, was temporary. It might have been possible, I suppose, to kill each master individually as he lay helpless, but we probably wouldn't find them all in time, quite apart from the fact that it was almost unlikely that the slaves would stand by idly while we did it. As long as the masters were not dead, but only unconscious, the power of the caps remained. The answer was to strike at the heart of the city and wreck it. We knew it was one of the first things Fritz had discovered were the machines that were controlled. We knew it was discovered the, as the first things Fritz had discovered where the machines were controlled. Uh, man, this grammar is insanely weird. <laughs> We knew it was the first of things that Fritz had discovered where the machines were that controlled the city's power, its heat and light and the force that produced this dragging leaden weight under which we labored. 
We headed in that direction. It was some way off, and Carlos suggested that we should use the horseless carriages which carry the masters about. Fritz vetoed that. Slaves drove the carriages for their masters, but did not use them otherwise. The masters were in no position to notice the infringement, but the slaves would, and we did not know how they would react. So we toiled along to Street 2 and to Ramp 914. The approach was through one of the biggest plazas in the city, lined with many ornate garden pools. The ramp itself was very broad and dipped under a pyramid that towered among, above its neighbors. From below came a hum of machinery that made the ground under our feet vibrate slightly. I had a sense of awe going down into the depths. It was a place that slaves never went near, and so we had not been able to earlier. This was the city's beating heart. How dared we think of penetrating it? The ramp led into a cavern twice or three times as big as it I had seen. The ramp led into a cavern twice or three times as big as any I had seen, made up of half three half circles around a central circle. In each of the hemispheres were vast banks of machinery, having hundreds of incomprehensible dials along their fronts. Scattered about the floor were the bodies of the masters who had tended them. Some clearly had dropped at their posts. I saw one whose tentacle was curled around a lever. The number of machines and their complexity confused us. I looked for the switches by which they might be turned off, but found none. The metal gleaming in a faint bronze was unyielding and seamless, the dials covered by toughened glass. We went from one to another, looking for a weak spot, but found nothing. Was it possible that even with the masters made impotent, their machines would continue to defy us? Fritz said, perhaps that pyramid in the middle. It occupied the dead center of the inner circle. The sides were about 35 feet at the base and formed equilateral triangles, so that the apex was more than 30 feet high. We had not paid attention to it before because it had, did not look like a machine, being featureless apart from a single triangular doorway, high enough to admit a master. But there were no fallen bodies anywhere near it. It was of the same bronze metal as the machines, but we did not hear a hum as we approached. Instead, there was a faint hissing noise rising and falling in volume and also in tone. The doorway showed only more blank metal inside. There was a pyramid within the pyramid and an empty space between them. We walked along the passage this formed and found that the inner pyramid also had a doorway but in a different place. We went through and faced a third pyramid inside the second. This too had a doorway in the side which was blank in the external pyramids. A glow came within. A glow came from within. We entered, and I stared in wonder. A circular pit took up most of the floor, and the glow was coming from there. It was a golden. It was golden, something like the golden balls produced in the sphere chase, but deeper and brighter. It was fire, but a liquid fire, pulsing in a slow rhythm which matched the rise and fall of the hissing sound. One had an impression of power, effortless, limitless, unceasing. Fritz said, this is it, I think. But how does one stop it? Mario said, on the far side, do you see? It lay beyond the glow, a single slim bronze column, about the height of a man. Something protruded from the top, a lever? Mario, not waiting for an answer, was going around the glowing pit toward it. I saw him reach up, touch the lever, and die. He made no sound and perhaps did not know what was happening to him. Pale fire ran down his arm, grasping the lever, divided and multiplied to leap in a dozen different streams along his body. He stayed like that for a brief instant, then he slumped and the lever came down with his dead weight before his fingers clasped, unclasped, and he slipped to the ground. There was a shocked murmur from the others. Carlos moved, as if to go to him. Fritz said, No, it would not do any good, and it might kill you too. But look, look at the pit. The glow was dying. It went slowly, as though reluctantly. The depths remained lambent while the surface still silvered, and then darkness over. Mm. The glow was dying. It went slowly, as though reluctantly. The depths remaining lambent while the surface first silvered, and then darkened over. The hissing faded, slowly, slowly, and this time into a whisper that trailed into silence. Deep down, the glow reddened to a dull crimson. Spots of, black spots of blackness appeared. 
increasing in size and ran together, until at last we stood there in silence and in pitch dark. In a low voice, Fritz said, we must get out, hold on to each other. At that moment, the ground shuddered under us, as though we were in a small earthquake, and suddenly we were liberated from the leaden weight which had dragged us throughout our time here. My body was light again. It felt as though thousands of little balloons attached to nerves and muscles were lifting me up. It is an odd thing. For all the sensation of lightness, I found myself desperately weary. We shuffled and groped our way through the maze of pyramids, blinding we shuffled and groped our way through the maze of pyramids, blind leading the blind. In the great cavern, it was just as black, the lights having gone out, black and silent, for there were no hum of machines any longer. Black and silent, for there was no hum of machines any longer. Fritz guided us to what he thought would be the entrance, but instead we came up against the banks of the machines. We went along, feeling the metal with our hands. Twice he checked, encountering the body of the master and once I found myself at the end of the line, unwittingly putting my foot on the end of a tentacle. It rolled under my foot and I wanted to be sick. At last we found the entrance, and making our way along the curving ramp saw the glimmer of green daylight ahead. We went more quickly and soon could not let go of each other. Mm. Man. We went more quickly and soon could let go of each other. We came out into the great plaza with the garden pools. I saw a couple of the masters floating in one of them and wondered if they had drowned. It really did not matter any longer. Three figures confronted us at the next intersection. Slaves, Fritz said. I wonder. They looked dazed, as though knowing themselves to be in a dream, on the point of waking, but not capable of bringing themselves into full consciousness. Fritz said, Greetings, friends. One of them answered, How, how do we get out of this place? Do you know a way? It was an ordinary, simple remark, but it told us everything. No slave would possibly seek a way out of the hellish paradise in which they could serve the masters. It meant that the control was broken, that caps were as powerless... No. It meant that the control was broken, the caps they wore as powerless as the ones they had put on for disguise. These were free men. And if this were the case inside the city, it must be equally true in the world outside. We were a fugitive minority no longer. We will find one, Fritz said. You can help us. We talked with them as we made our way toward the hall of the tripods, the gateway to the city. They were desperately confused. They remembered what they had, what had happened since they were capped, but could not make any sense of it. Their earlier selves, who had worshipfully tended the masters, were strangers to them. The horror of what they had experienced was slowly dawning in on them, but searing when it came. Once they all three stopped, where two masters had fallen side by side, and I thought they were going to be savage to them. Hmm. Golly. <laughs> Once they all three stopped, where two masters had fallen side by side, and I thought they were going to savage them. But after a long moment's looking, they turned their heads away, shuddering, and walked on. We met many of the capped. Some joined our party, others wandered aimlessly about, or sat staring into vacancy. Two were shouting nonsense, perhaps turned vagrant by the withdrawal of the master's influence, as others had been by this imposition. A third who possibly had gone the same way, was lying at the edge of one of the ramps. He had taken his mask off, and his face wore a hideous grimace of death. He had choked in the poisonous green air. Our band was something thirty strong when we came to the spiral ramp at the edge of the city, which rose to the platform that fronted the entering place. I have remembered coming down on my first day here, striving to keep upright on knees that buckled under me. We reached the platform, and were on a height above the smaller pyramids. There was the door, through which we had come from the changing room. On the other side of it, air we could breathe. I was ahead of the others and pressed a small button, which had worked the entrance to the airlock. Nothing happened. I pressed again, and again. Fritz had come up. He said we should have realized all the power for the city came from the pool of fire, including the power for opening the carriages, and also for opening and closing doors. It will not work now. We took turns hammering and banging against the barrier, but without success. Someone found a piece of metal and tried that. It dented the service, but the door would not yield. One of the newcomers said, fear plain in his voice, Then we are trapped in here. Could it be so? The sky was less bright as the afternoon faded. In a few hours it would be night and the city dark and lightless. The heat was no longer as powerful without the machines to maintain it. I wondered if cold would kill the masters, or if they might recover before the temperature dropped too low. 
and having recovered, relight the pool of fire, surely we could not be defeated now. I thought of something else, too. If this door would not open, neither would those in the communal places. We had no means of getting food or water. More important, no means of renewing the filters in our masks. We would choke to death, as that one lying on the ramp had done. I had an idea, from the look on Fritz's face, the thought, same thought had come to him. The one who was hammering with the metal said, I think it will give if we persist long enough. If you others found things to hammer with as well. Fritz said, it would not help. There is the other door beyond that, and then the entering place. The room that goes up and down will not be working, either. We could never get past that, and there will be no light in there. Silence registered agreement with what he had said. The one with the metal stopped hammering. We stood in a motionless, dispirited group. Carlos looked up at the vast crystal bubble covering the maze of ramps and pyramids. If we could only get up there, he said, and knock a hole in that. Jan sat down to rest his injured leg. He said, you can stand on my shoulders if you like. It was a feeble joke, and no one was in a mood for laughing. I drew a deep breath and winced at the pain in my bandaged ribs. I was trying to think of something, but all my brain was saying, trapped, trapped. Then one of the cats said, there is a way up. How can there be? My, he hesitated, one of them showed me. He was inspecting the dome, and I had to take things up to him. And there's a ledge running around, inside the dome, at the top of the wall. I said, we could never hope to break the dome. It must be stronger than the glass over the dials on the machines. I doubt if we could scratch its surface. We're going to try, though, Fritz said. I see no other way out except by the river. I had forgotten the river. I looked at him happily. Of course, why not do that? Escape through the river. He shook his head. We can't. We have to be sure they aren't able to take over again when they recover consciousness. We must wreck the city somehow while we still have the chance. I nodded, my optimism disappearing as rapidly as it had come. The river was no answer. We went down the ramp again, with our new guide leading the way. At one of the garden pools, we equipped ourselves with metal stakes. They had been used for training a certain creeping plant that ran along the edges of the pools, and we could wrench them out without too much difficulty. Coming away, I thought I saw one of the fallen masters stir. It was hardly anything, just a quiver of a tentacle, but the sight was ominous. I spoke to Fritz, and he nodded, and urged the guide to move faster. The way up, of which he had spoken, was in a part of the city filled with the tall tapering pyramids, one to which slaves had rarely gone. This was a ramp, too, but it which clung to the wall, narrow and vertiginously steep. He had warned us of that, and said that he did not know how he had climbed it on that earlier occasion, that he could not have done it if he had not had a direct order from his master. The ending of their gravity made it less difficult physically, but as we climbed higher and higher, and the unfenced abyss yawned beside and beneath us, the sensation was a terrifying one. I kept in as close to the gleaming surface of the wall as I could, and after one horrified glimpse did my best to avoid looking down. We reached the red ledge at last. It too was unfenced and no more than four feet wide. The masters must have no sensitivity to heights. It ran along inside the wall as far as the eye could see in either direction. The edge of the crystal bubble came down to within about eight feet of it. For one of the masters, of course, this would be below eye level, but for us, we had to try. Some made backs for the others, who clambered up and wielded their stakes awkwardly. I could not because of my ribs, but it was harrowing enough to watch them. The ledge seemed to shrink and the, an incautious movement participated the fear of falling to the ground, two or three hundred feet below. They hammered at the crystal, at what point it united with the metal of the wall, but there was no sign of a seam, they said, and no sign of their blows making any impression. A second team was forming farther along, and a third with no great success. Fritz said, stop a minute, to which the one... Fritz said, stop a minute, to the one who had guided us, and he went on. You met your master here? He shook his head. No, I did not see him. The command was to bring food and gas bubbles and leave them here. I stayed no longer than was necessary. You did not even see him farther along the ledge? No, but he must have been out of sight. One cannot see across to the far side. Well, one cannot see through the wall either. He might have been outside. 
They could not breathe out there in our air, and he did not have a mask with him. Fritz said they would need to be able to inspect the outside as well as the inside. It's worth looking for. He looked up at the sweep of crystal, with the pale disk of the sun well down toward the west. Someone had, unless someone has a better idea. No one had. We set out to walk along the ledge in a clockwise direction. On our right was the vertical drop to the city's streets. Some of the smaller pyramids looked like spikes, ready to impale a body that had dropped onto them. Some of the smaller pyramids looked like spikes, ready to impale a body that dropped on them. I felt sick from the height, and my chest was hurting badly. I supposed I could have fallen out and gone back, but it was not as though I was going to be of use to anyone in my condition. But the thought of leaving my companions was worse still. We trailed on. The top of the ramp was lost in the haze behind us. There was nothing to find, I was sure. The master wouldn't have simply... The master would have simply been out of sight of the ramp, as we now were. Then Fritz said, There is something! The others were obscuring my view, but after a moment I saw just what he meant. Just ahead, the ledge ended, and rather was replaced by something which projected out from the wall to take up the full space or more. A sort of blockhouse, and with a door and the door did not have a button to operate it. Instead, there was a wheel of the same golden metal as the wall. We crowded up, ignoring, ignoring vertigo for the moment. As Fritz... We crowded up, ignoring vertigo for the moment, as Fritz tried to turn the wheel. He got nowhere at first, and then, trying it in reverse direction, it moved. Not much, but enough to give us hope. He swung on, using on... He swung on it again, using all his strength, and it yielded a bit more. After a few minutes, he handed over to another. This continued, with volunteers working in relays. The wheel moved painfully slowly, but it went on moving, and at last we saw a crack widen in the side. The door was opening to us. As soon as the gap was wide enough, Fritz squeezed through, and we followed. There was light, partly from the open door and also from the squares of crystal in the roof. We could see our surroundings quite clearly. The blockhouse was slotted into the wall and extended on either side of it. It was very bare, but held some boxes which probably contained equipment and on a rack half a dozen mask suits which the masters could wear if they had to breathe human air. Fritz pointed to them. That is why he did not take a mask. mask. They were kept here. He looked around the cell-like room. They would not bring power all the way up here. It would not be worth it, so the doors are mechanically operated. There was another door facing the one through which we had come, and presumably giving access to a continuation of the ledge. At the far side, two similar doors faced each other. They must open on to a similar ledge, but outside the dome. I said, but if this is an airlock, you would need power for pumping the air. I do not think so. Remember, their air is denser than ours. A simple pressure-operated valve would do it. And the volume of air in here, compared with what the dome holds, is very small. Power is not necessary, Jan said. So all we have to do is open one of the doors outside. Well, what are we waiting for? Fritz put his hands on the wheel, tensed and heaved. His muscles bulged with the force he was applying. He relaxed and heaved again. Nothing happened. He stood back, wiping his brow. Someone else try. Several, several others did. Carlos said, this is ridiculous. The door is of the same... Carlos said, This is ridiculous. The door is the same as the other. The wheels are identical. Fritz said, Wait a minute. I think I may understand. Close the inner door. A wheel on this side complemented the other. It turned, though reluctantly. These had been made for master's strength, not human. At last the door was sealed. Now, Fritz said. He heaved on the outer door's wheel again. This time it moved. Slowly, slowly, but at last there was a crack of light, and the crack widened. There was the whistling noise of air escaping, the breeze of its passing on our bodies. Soon we were looking out onto a ledge, the outside of the dome, and the earthly landscape spread out below us. A patchwork of fields, streams, the distant mound of a ruined great city. The brightness of daylight made me blink my eyes. Fritz said, even the masters can make mistakes, so they had a device to prevent it. The doors to the outside will not open unless the doors to the inside are sealed, and the other way around, I should think. Try to open the inner door now. The attempt failed. It was clear what he was said was right. The attempt failed. It was clear that what he had said was right. 
Carlos said. Then we can open one door, but must smash through the other? Fritz was examining the door. That will not be easy. Look. The door was about four inches thick, made of a tough, gleaming metal that formed the wall. It had been machined to a satiny smoothness, and obviously to such a precision that even air would not pass between the opposing surfaces when it was sealed. Fritz picked up the spike he had been carrying and hammered at it. It made absolutely no impression that I could see. We had come to another, perhaps a final check. We could keep the inner door closed, and thus, with our natural air surrounding us, could remove our masks, so we would not suffocate. But we had no food, no water, and above all, no means of getting down the sheer cliff of the wall. In any case, unless we could puncture the shell of the city in some way, we faced the possibility of the masters recovering from their paralysis and relighting the pool of fire. We were all looking at the door. Carlos said, there is a difference between the inner doors and the outer ones. The first one opened inward, but this one opens out. Fritz shrugged. Because of the difference in pressure, it makes it easier for them. Carlos squatted, fingering the place where the door and the wall joined. The door itself is too strong to be broken, but the hinges... Hinges ran all the way up the inside, thin and bright and gleaming with a little oil, renewed, perhaps, by the master who had unwittingly led us here. Fritz said, I think we could break them. But we can only get at them with the door open, which means the inner door is sealed. How does that help? We'll not break them entirely, Carlos said, but if we were to weaken them, then close the door, then, after opening the inner door, try to hammer them from the open, from the inside. It might work. At any rate, we can try. They got down to it, two at a time, hammering at the joints of the hinges. It was not easy, but a cry of triumph told us that the first had broken. Others followed, and then they went through them systematically, leaving only a single hinge at the top and that one at the bottom untouched. Then the door was wound shut again, and the inner door opened. Right, said Fritz. Now we hammer top and bottom. They banged and thumped with the metal stakes. Fritz and Carlos had started. When they were exhausted, they passed the task on to others. These, in turn, tired and were replaced. Minus dragged by, to the monotonous, unchanging clang of metal on metal. The crystal squares in the roof of the blockhouse were darkening, dusk beginning to fall. I wondered if the masters were stirring yet, moving about in confusion, but with a purpose, making their way toward the dark pit where the fire had danced, and might dance again. I said, can I have a go? I'm afraid you would be little help, Fritz said. All right, Carlos, you and I once more. The hammering went on. Then my ear caught something else, a sort of creak. It came again and again. Harder, Fritz called. There was a sound of metal tearing. The two hinges must have given way simultaneously. Hmm. What am I doing on time? It's about to click over. I gotta... There's no break in this. Okay, I'll see what I can do. There was a sound of metal tearing. The two hinges must have given away almost simultaneously. The door began to fall and I glimpsed the open sky graying now. This was the last thing I noticed clearly for quite some time, because as the door collapsed outward, a great wind swept through the blockhouse from open door to open door, a gale plucking one outward. Someone shouted, Get down! I dropped to the floor, and it was a little better there. I felt it tearing at my back, but I stayed where I was. It roared through, but it was like no noise of wind I had ever heard, because it stayed on one note, unvarying, a harsh, unending bellow. One could not speak above, above the din, and anyway, I was too dazed to have said anything. I could see the others scattered on the floor. It was incredible that it could go on for so long, unchanging. But change came at last. The noise was overlaid by another, sharper, far sound, more terrifying. Hmm. Uh, I'm going to track it here. But change came at last. The noise was overlaid by another, sharper, far louder, more terrifying sound. It sounded as though the sky was splitting and tearing to shreds, and a moment later the wind died. I was able to get groggily to my feet, only now realizing that my ribs were hurting even more after dropping to the floor. Several of us went to the inner doorway. We looked out silently, too odd for comment. The crystal dome had shattered inward. Quite a lot still adhered to the top of the wall, but a jagged hole extended all across the center. Huge shards had fallen on the city. One seemed to be covering the sphere arena. I learned... I turned to look at Fritz. He was standing alone by the outer door. I said, that's it. Not one of them could have survived. There were tears in his eyes, of joy. 
I thought, but there was no joy in his expression. I asked, what's the matter, Fritz? Carlos. He gestured toward the open door. I said in horror, no! The wind took him, though. I tried to hold him, but I couldn't. We looked out together. The wall was a precipice beneath our feet. Far, far down, a tiny square of gold marked the position of the blockhouse door. Near it lay a small black speck. We ripped off our masks and could breathe ordinary air. The mat green air of the masters had spread out and been lost in the vastness of the world's natural atmosphere. We made our way back along the ledge and down the steep ramp into the city. I was glad we had not left any of it later than this. Light was fading rapidly and poor visibility did nothing to improve my feeling of dizziness, but we got down at last. The communal places inside the pyramids were still barred to us. We found stores of food, though, in open warehouses and broke open the crates to eat it. There were drinking fountains in several places, put there to serve the thirst of passing masters, and we drank from them. The bodies of the masters themselves lay scattered about in the glowing dark. We were joined by more and more of the capped. They were shaken and bewildered, and some had been injured by fragments of the falling dome. We cared for them as best we could. Then we settled down to endure a long, cold spring night. It was not pleasant, but at least stars shone overhead, the diamond stars of Earth. In the morning, shivering, Fritz and I discussed what to do. We still could not get through the inner hall without a slow and arduous process of breaking down doors, and the door in the wall that admitted the tripods would be well-nigh impossible proposition. We could escape by way of the river, of course, but that too would not be easy. In my own case, probably suicidal. I said, we could tie things together to make a rope if there are stocks and materials they use to make clothes for the slaves, and let ourselves down from the blockhouses. It would take a long rope, he said. I think it might be worse than the river, but I've been wondering. What? All the masters are dead. If we were to start the pool of fire again... How? Remember Mario? I do. The power killed him, but that switch was m meant to be used by a tentacle. They are of a different substance to our flesh. Perhaps the power does not run through it. Are we to chop off a tentacle and use it to push the lever up? It's an idea, he said, but not what I had in mind. The fire was on when Mario grasped the lever. It died slowly. If it also starts slowly, do you see what I mean? There might be no danger until the fire is burning. I said slowly, you could be right. I'll do it. No, Fritz said decisively, I will. That is not the end of the chapter. I'm on, oh, two, <laughs> two, two pages left. Okay. <sighs> All right. We went down the ramp into the hall of the machines. The darkness was absolute, and we had to guess our way toward the central pyramid. There was a strange smell, like rotting leaves, only more pungent, and when I had the misfortune to stumble over the body of one of the masters, I realized where it was coming from. They were beginning to decompose, and I suppose it was more evident down here than out in the streets. We missed the pyramid completely the first time, and came up against the banks of machines in one of the hemispheres beyond. Our second attempt was more successful. I touched smooth metal and called out to Fritz to join me. Together we felt our way around to the side with the entrance and through the maze of concentric pyramids. It was no darker here, of course, than anywhere else in the hall, but I was more afraid. The confinement, perhaps, had something to do with it that and the fact that we were approaching the pit where the fire had burned. As we came to a third entrance, Fritz said, You stay here, Will. Come no farther. I said, Don't be silly. Of course I'm coming. No. His voice was flat and final. It is you who are being silly. If anything goes wrong, you are in charge. A safe way out of the city will still need to be found. I was silent, recognizing the truth of what he said. I could ed hear him edging his way around, avoiding the central pit. It took a long time, because he went cautiously. At last he said, I have reached the column. I am feeling for the switch now. I have it. I have pushed it up. You are all right? Get away from it, just in case. I have done that, but nothing is happening. There is no sign of the fire. Nor was there. I strained my eyes into blackness. Perhaps it had been out too long. Perhaps there was something else that needed doing, which we could not guess at. His voice was showing disappointment. And then he said, I'm on my way back. I put a hand out, and he grasped it. He said, we will have to be... I put a hand out, and he grasped it. 
He said, it will have to be the rope, or the river. It's a pity I had hoped we could control the city. I thought at first it might be my eyes playing tricks with me, showing spots of brilliance as they sometimes do in the darkness. I said, wait, and then look. He turned with me, and we both stared. Down in what must be the bottom of the pit, a spark flickered into being, followed by another, and another. They grew, and ran together, and began glowing brightly. The fire spread and leapt as we watched, and the hissing noise began, and the whole pit was shimmering with it as radiance filled the room. Three more chapters. This, this next one is only like, I don't know. And Fourteen. Fifteen pages. Dang. Thirteen. Nine. Fifteen, thirteen, and nine. Well, I'm going to stop here because I'm exhausted. Not exhausted exactly, but I am tired enough that I'm tired of talking and my voice is giving out because it's late at night. I'll put in some more tomorrow. Streamed, I don't know, but this is kind of fun. I have an entire fourth book I could also do. <sighs> All right. Well, thank you both for joining me.